I would like to say thanks to the uh, Nottingham University Business School for asking me to uh, come along tonight. I always find it um, slightly bemusing when I'm asked to do these talks because I'm often doing them to an audience of guys like you uh, who have almost without doubt and invariably more traditional education, training and um, uh, formal uh, academic uh, input than I had. I'll come more on to that in a little while. Um, just before I start the story, uh, there's a couple of uh, apologies I want to make. Firstly, I've got a goddamn cold, so if I get my handkerchief out, forgive me, and if I clam up, a lot of audience find that a blessing. So <laughs> we'll see how it goes. The other one is, uh, forgive the notes. I don't like using them, but I like missing things even more or less. As Bart was saying, um, and by way of a background, um, I've been involved in various businesses over the years and consider myself a business builder um, as opposed to all the other permutations and denominations that uh, come into the overall business uh, gamut. Um, we'll come on to the entrepreneur business shortly, if I may. Prior to uh, graduating, which is about the only graduating I've ever done, to being a business builder, uh, I was trained as a salesman, and effectively, I was always looking for a product as a kid in my early 20s. I was looking for a product to build a, uh, a direct selling business round. That was my trade, that was my training, and uh, we used to eat, sleep, drink, selling. And that was what I was doing. I eventually found that um, product after a number of um, enterprises and ventures that um, uh, fell flat on their face. Uh, I found that product and my primary, primary business for a long time uh, was called Sinseal. Uh, it's a business that I started in the Ashfield area of Nottinghamshire and it's still based there. Um, I started the business on Easter Sunday, 1980, which is a little bit like attending this type of soiree on Halloween night, but anyway, Easter Sunday was a good day, so that's when we started it. Um, and I sold it on the 23rd of February last year, um, which probably gives a strong indication that I've got a masochistic streak because trying to sell businesses in the last few years has not been great fun. Nevertheless, we got it away. Since Seal was originally um, operating as a direct fix and sell company, uh, selling and installing UPVC windows and doors directly to the homeowner. Over the years, the business went through various incarnations, transformations and developments. And um, immediately prior to Sinseal, I ran my own building services company that was mainly involved with the supp supply and fix of bathrooms and showers to uh, the homeowner again. Also, and again, the emphasis was on the sales and marketing because element because that's where, that's where my personal expertise for what it was worth lay. My training was, as a kid was in sales and I found it a very good grounding and has proved extremely useful over the years. When all said and done, you know, we have to, whether it's a, a service or a product uh, or even an idea, it always has to be sold and invariably, perhaps a little after the inventor, um, selling comes before all the other things that we learn about business as we go. On the first day of opening, by way of a, uh, an interesting stat, um, on this uh, very exciting um, Easter Sunday, where I opened what I pretentiously called a showroom, uh, it was actually a corner shop that we'd knobbed up to look like a showroom, and uh, I'd chosen that as a strategy primarily because the industry that I was embarking upon hadn't enjoyed the best of reputations and my theory, strategy was that okay, if we've got a showroom, we look credible and people have got somewhere to come and I wanted them to come and pay their bills but it also gave them somewhere to come and complain if necessary. So it gave us a bit of an edge there. On the first day uh, that we opened, um, I, took, uh, I took 32 inquiries. Um, to put that in perspective, between the Easter Sunday, the Easter Sunday and the Tuesday following, 
48 hours, I'd sold £10,000 worth of uh, product. Um, needless to say, on the Tuesday night, I was one happy boy. Um, the, uh, to put that in perspective, my um, building services business hitherto had been turning over something like 10 grand a month. So I'd gone from 10 grand a month to 10 grand in the first two days, you know, that was maniana. Um, and again, to put that in further perspective, when I sold Sinseal on the 23rd of February last year, it was turning over £10,000 every 12 minutes. So it did take a long time, but um, we, uh, we, did, uh, we did move ahead quite a pace. And uh, when, we, when we were just before the crash in 2007, when things fell away a wee bit, uh, we were turning over, just, we were on target to turn over £100 million. The company still occupies a factory unit of uh, half a million square feet, which I developed over, well, I don't know, 20 years, I suppose, kept adding to and buying land and developing the business. Um, it stands on a 32-acre site, and I'm pleased to say that although I don't own Sinseal anymore, I do still own the factories, and they do pay me a nice lump of rent for that. Not only do I wish them well in the business, because it was my baby that I conceived, gave birth to and nurtured to being a 30-year-old, five weeks off 30, um, I want them to continue doing well so I can keep drawing my rent as well. Um, on the personal side, I'm a Nottingham guy born and bred. Um, I was married at 19 and I have a son, Nick, who's worked for me now for 20 years. Apart from the things that we all like to do, my interests, as Bart mentioned, are driving boats, shooting guns and business. And as you may expect, the idea of not having a business when I decided to exit Sinsil uh, was quite simply not acceptable. Um, the void that that would have left, you know, shooting guns and driving boats, I love to bits, but not every day of the week. Um, I knew it wasn't going to be acceptable, and I now have two new companies, as again, as Bart mentioned, Doorstop International, which is um, a manufacturing business again, and um, manufactures a um, hybrid composite door product, um, and another embryonic company called Yale Door, which is almost going full circle to where I began, because that company buys its products from Doorstop International and sells them. Um, through websites and uh, backed up with TV and Google and all the rest of it and sells and installs to the general public. Um, <coughs> pardon me. Over the last 10 years, I've had umpteen, or I, I had umpteen offers to sell Sinseal. You know, in the early noughties when um, banks and um, banks had got money that they wanted to lend and strange things like that. And, and um, the trade market was uh, flush with, uh, with cash, and I had, many, uh, I had many approaches. And to be perfectly honest, the idea of um, having shed loads of cash was appealing. Uh, but I can tell you now, uh, it was probably one of the most agonizing, and I use the word deliberately, agonizing um, considerations um, that I, I think I've probably ever had to do. Because to actually sell it, and think, hey, this is all right, but where do I go next? It's just not, it's not something that's easy to come, come to. Um, I didn't want, really, to exit without having another job and another business. Over the years, we learned, quite frankly, and I think the other thing that um, stuck in my mind was, you know, I've met, as we all do, we meet lots and lots of people, and lots and lots of people I've met have been um, successful in their own sphere of business, and... Quite often, they were interesting and sharp people, and uh, they sell up, and uh, then there's a, a, a horrid sort of uh, blank in front of them. Often, if they're really successful, they don't know the price of a first-class stamp, because people have been getting their stamps for years. And that sort of infinitesimal issue is, suddenly becomes quite important. <coughs> and the other thing that I found with a lot of people that I spoke to over the years is that they'd sell up, They'd be all enthusiastic and happy about, you know, having, uh, having sold. Um, and then perhaps they'd go and, they'd like playing golf. And I've seen so many of them. They'd go out and play golf and they loved it and it was great. And they start at 8.30 in the morning 
and um, they're in the 19th hole by about 12.30, and they're pissed for the rest of the day. <laughs> Which is great, but it wasn't for me. Don't get me wrong, I like my boats, I like my guns, and I like a drink. But in the, at the end of the day, I'm a businessman. I was also in there, and this is in the public domain, so I make no bones about it, I was also in the fortunate position when thinking about selling that I'd uh, amassed sufficient uh, reserves that I managed to pay myself a, a £25 million divvy in the early noughties. Uh, so I wasn't unduly worried in those days about paying my wife's housekeeping. And the early days when we had the electricity switched off for three weeks, which they used to do back then, um, um, because I couldn't pay a £26 electric bill, seemed a long way away. And I'm very happy it was. Moving on a, little, a wee bit, two of the questions that I've been asked, and I suppose a lot of blokes like me do get asked um, often, is um, why did you do it? And what's the secret of coming from nothing uh, to being the industry market leader? In response to the first one, I suppose I'm like a lot of self-made guys, I wanted the money and the trappings and the security that it brings with you. Uh, but if I'm really honest, my motivation was I wanted to prove I could be good at something. Um, there was no way I was going to become a scholar. And although I liked sports and music, I had completely zilch talent. Um, so that narrowed it down a fair bit. Um, and I also wanted to be well off. Um, in a way, I envy people like you guys that receive, receive university training and a formal education, commercial education, but I suppose somewhat perversely, um, not having anything to lose can be useful. Uh, you know, I'll come to this business about entrepreneurs in a minute, but quite often I think, uh, you know, entrepreneurs are more like me because you leave school at 16, you've got no formal training, you've not put an extra six or seven years of your life into learning something, be it business or whatever. Um, so we can, we can kick off and we've got nothing to lose, you know. When, when a business goes uh, down the toilet, as unfortunately I've had a number that have done, um, fine, you learn, but it's not a catastrophe. Uh, so th there, is, um, there is something, I think, to be said for uh, both ways, notwithstanding I still envy you guys, because that would have saved me a lot of the failures um, that I suffered, which hurt and maybe I'd have got where I was going quicker, but anyway, that's all conjecture at this stage of the game. Um, one thing for sure, uh, calamities and what have you, catastrophes do, um, do is focus the mind. Um, this sure as hell teach you, what, teach you what not to do wrong again. You know, if uh, the first time, maybe it's a mishap, maybe you've been overwhelmed, maybe you've been stupid, maybe you've tripped yourself up, overwhelmed by circumstance, but if you do it wrong two or three times, that's just downright clumsy. So, yeah, um, when it comes to the question of what's the secret to my success, um, which I find slightly embarrassing, but it's a, it's a fairly complex issue, but not something I struggle with too much, because unlike you guys that learn your lessons the way that you're learning them and have learned them, and I learned, if you like, if you'll excuse that cliched expression, through the university of life. Um, I believe that there are theories to uh, business, as there are to salesmanship, as there is to uh, heart surgery, or anything else for that matter. Um, and I've compiled my own principles and convictions and philosophies over the years. And one of these, for what it's worth, is that I believe there's a lot of similarities between the military, the game of chess and business. I don't know whether you guys play chess, I'm sure some of you do, but when you think about the military and business and chess, you've got an infrastructure, you've got discipline, you've got focus, you've got concentration, and you've got to have a, uh, a regard for the resource in all three, chess, military and business. Again, there are strategies, polic policies and tactics, and often I've spoken to people about these, and I'm sure there are various textbook definitions, but nevertheless, my um, conviction on these, and you'd be surprised how many successful guys don't really know the difference between the three, 
Um, I believe that um, the, uh, a, a strategy is a series of plans, series of objectives. I believe that policy is the disciplines and rules applied in achieving those strategies and tactics are fundamentally the detailed methodology in arriving at the set objectives. I believe that if you get any of those three fundamentals wrong, whether you're in the military playing chess or running a business, you'll either wind up second at chess, uh, losing the war, or the business going bust. Another one of my homespun beliefs, um, planning is imperative. And so many people I have known don't seem to have much regard for the basic components of a business plan. Now, again, there's a myriad of different um, definitions, um, but the one that's always stood me in good stead and the one, if ever I'm asked to make a decision on something f serious and important and potentially um, earth-moving commercially, I always try to think back to the basics. Um, and it's very easy to get blasé and complacent sometimes. But I always say, right, let's go back to the basics. And some of my guys over the years have said, oh, boss, why do I, I say, because I'm the boss, that's why we do it, because that's why I got here, that's why we're all drawing wages here, and that's what we're going to do. And I believe the first step in the business plan is the concept. It's got to be. Somebody's got to have an idea. There's got to be a concept to anything. The second one, I believe, is the research into all aspects of that concept. And that research has got to be fairly in-depth and it's got to be fairly thorough. And um, it's got to cover the competition, the SWAT, the markets, the demographics, and all the rest of the <coughs> issues. Excuse me. When you start to draw up the plan itself, showing the intentions based on that research. And that has to be a fairly comprehensive and detailed document. But we're just touching on headers here. I believe the fourth is a breakdown of that plan, broken down and to include your budgets, your cash flows, your investments, and all the other financials. And the fifth one, and this is probably the one that people take least notice of, they all say, right, we're going to get this and we've got it all done and it looks great and we're going off into the sunset and uh, we're going to start on January the 1st. That's great. The only thing they don't do is a program to commencement. Um, I think sometimes they call them Gantt charts, where, uh, you know, everything's blocked off on a piece of paper because I'm, I'm not used to using screens and things. Do it on a bit of paper, nail it up on the wall, and on that, you know, it'll have, right, so-and-so to do so-and-so. Brian, get that done. You've got till the week on Monday. Bart, you're going to have your jobs done by when? And you track it through. Because otherwise you get to the 1st of January or the 31st of December and you have not got a snowball in hell's chance of getting it done for the end of January, let alone the 1st. Getting the planning right, but also retain room for being flexible when circumstances require is paramount. I know that sounds slightly contradictory, but you've got to have a critical path. But, you know, if you're going down the road and there's a, it's blocked... You've got to have a plan B as well. And it doesn't, it's not a bad thing to have a plan Z as well, just in case everything goes wrong. But, you know, you've got to have that flexibility. I think a lot of people get too dogmatised and don't necessarily think, oh, well, what if? It's an expression that I've used many times over the years. And then comes the big one. <coughs> the most important single issue in building any successful business is focus on three priorities. And this I believe with all my heart, and I think I've earned the right to say that I've proven it, in reverse order, if I, not to sound too much like the X Factor, in reverse order, it's funding. And a lot of academics, and especially from the accountancy fraternity and the hedge funds and the banks, etc., will vehemently disagree with me. I don't give a toss, because that just means they're wrong. <laughs> Fact of the matter is, that uh, funding is obviously necessary. Second one in reverse order is timing. 
I'll come back to timing in a minute. And the first one, by a country mile, and we're talking about Man United playing Knox County here, um, it's people. It's people. That's all it is. And the bigger you grow, the more important that particular resource becomes. OK, you know, you need funding. But with good people, you'll either borrow the money or make the money or get investment in the business. With second-rate or no-rate people, you'll not get the loan, not get the investment, and if you do, you'll probably blow it anyway. The point of timing, I believe, is not just knowing when to initiate something, but also when to identify and recognise and abort something that's not going to work. Too many businesses, I believe, founder due to the arrogance, because it's ever so easy to get arrogant, you know, you think you can walk on water after a while. Um, the Midas touch, that's what a lot of them like to talk about. You know, they love being told they're an entrepreneur and they've got the Midas touch. Um, uh, yeah, too many businesses I've f uh, discovered and noticed have founded due to arrogance and being <coughs> oblivious to when something isn't going to work. Even Warren Buffett, who is one of my heroes and probably, arguably, the greatest invest in investor in the history of human beings, um, one of his things is, one of the times to sell a, sell a share is when it's not working. Get rid of it, you know. Don't keep knocking on to the bitter end because you'll dig a bigger hole and you get to the point of no return. So I use the phrase, when the amber light comes up, see it and don't wait for the red. And it's important, believe me. I always think there's a similarity between that and uh, businesses that have cash flow problems. Too many businesses, profitable businesses, go under purely because they haven't got any cash. You can be making profits, no cash, you can't pay the rent, you can't pay your supplies, you can't pay your staff, you are buried. End of. Going back to the business of people, <coughs> as, a business, as businesses grow, they need more structure in order to avoid suffocation. Um, there are certain benchmarks as a business grows, depends on the industry and the type of business it is, but uh, you can usually define, you know, in my business, for instance, when it, when it got up to about five million a year, it needed the basic fundamentals of, a, of an infrastructure. Uh, from then on, it was a one-man band with loads of Indians and, you know, that's it. But then we needed the three prime um, elements, uh, the salesman, if you like, um, the accountant, the bean counter, and the operations, the manager, the manufacturing guy. I have what's called, or have developed, is a better word, I've developed a rule that I call the seventh rule. And I know some people have heard of it, um, um, but uh, more haven't is my experience. The seventh rule basically means that no one person should have more than seven people reporting directly to him. That's in an operational scenario, okay? You don't want more than seven people reporting directly to you, you know, on a daily basis. You haven't got time to do your job, you know? Um, <coughs> excuse me, although part of your job is to talk to those people. But the, the seventh rule I've found is very good. Um, I had seven directors working directly for me at Sincere, and they would have seven senior managers, sometimes six, sometimes eight, but not 15, right? You don't go off like that. Um, and they would have the senior managers, they have seven guys apiece. You can imagine the, um, the tiered formula creates a pyramid of controlled management. Um, and Sincere, at its peak, employed about a thousand people. So that, that tiered structure was necessary. You know, what, no one guy can do everything, and if he does, he's an idiot, or if he thinks he can. A couple more um, one-offs. Again, my um, philosophies and um, what have you. Um, you guys might have heard of Peter's Principle. Uh, it's the principle, Dr. Peter's Principle, 
when somebody, what is it about, tell me if I'm misquoting, when he reaches the maximum of his incompetency, isn't it? Um, when somebody hits Peter's principle, he must go. And one of my biggest mistakes over the years, and there's been enough, but one of my biggest ones um, is I know somebody's got to go, he's hit Peter's principle, he's passed his sell-by date, we've outgrown him, etc., etc. My biggest problem is not having said, look, this ain't working, mate. And it's no good, you're not doing him any favours. Um, the other one, on the reverse side of a similar coin, I believe, is um, when somebody is indispensable and the business and the directors and the owner identify that person as being indispensable, you've got some problems coming. You cannot have anybody that's indispensable. If it starts to depend upon single individuals, eh, oh, start thinking about the receiver's office. Um, now, this word entrepreneur. As far as I'm concerned, entrepreneurs are businessmen, and businessmen are entrepreneurs. Let's just get one thing straight. Entrepreneur, very glamorous word, very fashionable word. You know, it's a lot more interesting than businessman. Um, but I think even the, the concept and the whole thing about entrepreneurialism is misconstrued. You know, when we look at the, 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 the translation of the word entrepreneur, it simply means enterprise or enterpriser. That's what it is, you know, an enterpriser. Somebody that goes into an enterprise. Venture, business. It does not mean, and this is where I think a lot of people get it wrong, my opinion, but there you go. Uh, it doesn't mean a risk taker in the sense of being a gambler. Um, they're people that go to the casino. Um, as, far as, um, as far as I'm concerned, this confusion um, should not be, well, it should not be confused with being a risk manager. Now, I believe that's what I've been. Now, some of the risks might have been a bit hairy. Some of them might have looked a bit ballsy, you know, but often, I remember when we first started in the uh, evolution of Sinseal, when we were manufacturing windows and doors, and I decided to go and um, uh, set up an extrusion plant. And I went and bought two extrusion machines, and these things were a quarter of a million quid each, and all the infrastructure, and I had to find the man to run them, and all the rest of it. And a lot of people thought, <coughs> God, he's brave or he's stupid, one or the other. And it was neither in truth, because had I not have actually sold a stick of profile externally, I'd got enough in-house use for the profile to make my own windows that it wasn't dangerous, it wasn't risky, and it wasn't necessarily brave. And that's what I'm trying to say by, by way of um, risk management. You know, we started off saying that um, the um, uh, that that that, that uh, business covers covers the whole gamut, and and so it does. You know, you've got all kinds of businessmen and women and businesses, and you've got gamblers, you've got manipulators, you've got investors, you've got acquirers, you've got builders, etc., etc. <coughs> Pardon me. And I do choose to regard myself as a, as a builder. You know, when you think about it, there are bankers, hedge funds, private equity firms, and many other descriptions. For goodness sake, you know, we've even got politicians that describe themselves as businessmen, when quite often, you know, their experience in business has been having a clerk handle the business end, and they go off to be lawyers or something like that. I suppose they're in the business of lawyering or soliciting. I think I preferred soliciting. Um, I personally, uh, especially of recent times, hold a, hold a view um, that, um, and this, this is probably straying from why I was invited here today, but I suggest most politicians in this day and age couldn't run a bath, let alone a successful business. And they sure as hell don't seem to be doing a good job of running Great Britain PLC. Might seem a little bit harsh, but, you know, I also think that if you look back over the last few years, I personally don't try, I don't try and defend the banks. I think they've been disgraceful. I think they've been greedy, immoral, unprofessional. But at the end of the day, you know, if you let a crowd of kids into a sweetie shop, they will eat the sweeties. 
And that is exactly what the government allowed them to do. They let all these greedy people go into the sweetie shop and they gobbled the lot up. Now, you know, we call them government because we pay them to govern. Why didn't they govern? Why didn't they regulate them? Why didn't they control them? And now, all these years on, we've still got them pontificating on television and the news every single day, you know, about what we're going to do about the economic problems. <coughs> we're not going to do anything until the banks start lending. You know, those banks must start lending. And I can't get my head round, like, we own 84% of RBS. Now, why not buy the other 16%? And instead of asking them to start lending, then you say, oh, uh, you're the chief exec. Right, this is how you're going to be lending me, old son, from Monday morning. Otherwise, you're not here on Friday. <laughs> it's ever so simple, that. But, you know, maybe I'm just old-fashioned. Hey, let's be fair about it. You know, if somebody said to, to us, you know, here's a lorry load of cash at uh, next to no interest, we're all going to say, yeah, we'll have, a, we'll have a few buckets of that, thank you very much. And then what we're going to do? We're going to look to getting a turn on that money. And one of the easiest ways of getting a turn, of course, is sell it at high rates to um, high-risk recipients. Then we, all these loans we've given out, we wrap them up in paper, lo lovely word, wrapper, and we stamp AAA on it, and then we, we sell them off as securities. And it's wonderful. It's like musical chairs. Um, great until the music stops, and then somebody, somebody's got to open the wrapper. And he opens the wrapper and takes all the stars off, and basically what he's got in there is a complete pile of crap. Right? And that's exactly what happened. And I just find it mind-blowing, I really do. They should have been stopped, but maybe the government were too happy drawing the re revenue as well, the music played. Anyway, enough of my politics. I've been involved with a fairly broad spectrum of business, the business world, um, and like I've said a couple of times, um, I believe I'm a business builder. By business building, I mean growing a business over a period of time, and 30 years is a fair old period of time. Um, it's included acquisitions, it's included disposals, it's included business closures, <coughs> pardon me, but it's mainly focused on organic building. Ooh. Excuse me. I'm coming to the close, for those that were wondering when it was going to come. Um, Professor Greenaway, the gaffer around here, um, when he uh, intimated that I might like to come along tonight, and this was six or seven months ago, and I'm sure if you know Professor Greenaway, when he intimates something, it's akin to a royal command, you know. Um, so, yes, Prof, I'll, uh, I'll show up. Um, and he asked me to come along, and I agreed on the basis that I would describe some of my experiences associated with convictions, theories, philosophies derived from the journey. And in a few minutes, I'm just going to invite some questions, and I'll answer them as best I can. Way back in the 90s, um, when Sinsil had gone into uh, vertical integration into chemical blending as well as manufacturing of the end product and uh, extrusion, I was looking for a payday, quite frankly. And um, uh, that uh, payday uh, resulted um, with me spending a year uh, with the Tarquins. Um, that's my word for the city boys. Uh, the brokers and the market makers and the rest of them. Um, we won't go on that. If he ever invites me back, we might touch on that next time because it's a <coughs> wonderful experience and it has absolutely nothing with building businesses. It's all perception and reality. It's all smoke and mirrors. Um, anyway, needless to say, I aborted that exercise just before what they call the beauty parade. The following year, I pursued, and I'm going back now to uh, the mid-90s, I pursued, I'd also got a conflict because I was selling in the same market as my customers were selling, and I wanted a few quid. I'd been at it 15 years, and I'd been working before that, so I thought I was due. Um, so I pursued, <coughs> I pursued a trade sale of the window division, and eventually sold it to a firm called JBS Industries, and I sold it on the 1st of January, 19. 95 for three and a quarter million pounds. We'd had some tax restructuring, so that gave me a nice pot of cash to um, build myself a nice new house and also put some more into developing the business. 
Later, when I had doorstop up and running, and as I said at the beginning, I wanted something else to go to, I felt it was uh, time for me to exit my baby, as I call Simseal, entirely. I tried to trade sell the company <coughs> in the worst economic times in living memory, which was a complete and utter waste of time, totally hopeless. So during the early part of 2009, I changed tack and eventually sold to a private equity-backed MBO, completing the deal in February last year. The enterprise value is in the region of 80 million, and with the dividends and bits and bobs, PwC tells me, tell me that I'm worth something over a hundred million quid. Um, not bad for a council house kid with no O levels. And uh, doorstop is the uh, the next event, and that will turn over more than 20 million pounds this year. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's a very abridged version of my story so far. I could go on and bore you all night with my views on other issues like unions and God knows what, but the prof set me a time limit, so was, uh, I'd better shut it and say uh, thanks very much for listening and has anybody got any questions? Sir? So. Um, a question for me. You, you talked about the people being number one priority. Yeah. If you thought about your style of leadership management being developed over the years, mm -hmm. how, would you, how would you proffer that and describe it? Um, dictatorial dictatorial uh, <laughs> uh, diplomat or um, something akin to that. I, uh, I, I, I've got a very simple uh, method uh, when it comes to management. Um, I don't believe in partnerships in any way, shape or form. I believe partnership, there's only one bad ship and that's a partnership. I believe they will implode sooner or later and there are many examples of that. Even White and Hansen had to put the Atlantic between them before they got at each other's throats. Uh, to answer the question that you asked in specifics, um, I, I always include, I run a very open ship. Forgive all the maritime metaphors by the way, I made a mistake with it. Um, I always run a very open ship. I make sure that my, my inner sanctum, that's my main people, notwithstanding everybody to an extent, but your main gang, the, the guys that run the, the show, they know everything that's going on. Um, we will always discuss it. Um, so my flippancy about uh, beneficial dictatorships and uh, what have you doesn't really apply. Um, we always, we'll, we'll always discuss, I will always listen. Um, I think when you stop listening, you're heading, heading for trouble. Um, we, will, we will always go through the whys and wherefores, but then there's a decision. And uh, almost invariably, what I decide will have been what the majority were looking for anyway, because um, I'm good, but if seven guys tell me I'm wrong, then probably chances are I'm wrong. Um, so... Usually, uh, you know, it's, a, it's the majority agree with what I decide to do, but then everybody pulls the same way. No ifs, no buts, no maybes. And another tangent answer to what you've just said. The other, and it's, I try and keep things simple. I think a lot of people make it too difficult. Um, the other thing that I, I developed was when we're doing budgets for the following year, okay, I was fairly uh, operational and um, I'd look and I'd say, right, I'm going to want bottom right-hand corner, pre-tax profits, and then I'd give it the bean counters and say, right, lads, work that back up, right? Watch the turnover. Then I'd get all my made men, as I called them, because we ran a bit like the mafia, you know, we're a bit melodramatic, you know, my made men. Uh, I'd say, right, lads, operational guy, uh, manufacturing guys, um, IT guys, etc., etc. <coughs> Tell me what you want to give me that. Now, that, that's, I found that absolutely brilliant because they tell you, OK, some of it's outrageous. You say, don't be stupid. Go and sit in a room and have a drink until you grow up. But ordinarily, you know, they'll come back and they'll tell you what they need. They tell you, I need six more people, two more machines, four more lorries. Oh, and by the way, another factory. And I always used to say to them, yeah, and also, what do you want? Is there anything you want? Well, yeah, I'd like, um, you know, I'd like it to be recognised if we do do that. And what I used to do is get a consensus on that and uh, say, right, lads, now you've all said that 
If you are given this, you will give me that. I'm going to give it you all. And in three months' time, if you haven't given it me, then we've got a problem, haven't we? And it will be your problem. And it works, it really does. So, yeah, that, that I think simply describes how I perform. And I, I find in the main, you know, you can't get on with everybody, but in the main, uh, the guys uh, that, I've, uh, that I've had working for me, you know, um, the guy that's with me now at, since, uh, at Doorstop, he started with me in 1981. He was the managing director at Sinsil for 10 years. He's with me now. Having said that, nobody else will employ him um, <laughs> because he is a nasty piece of work. But um, he's been with me 30 years and some of the other guys at Sinsil were with me 15, 20 years, you know. Does that answer? Thank you very much. Anybody else? Sir? So, as students of entrepreneurship, a lot of emphasis is done on innovation, being novel, and we are advised to be ruthless about not being biased on your product and to speak about if it's incremental or if it's radical. I wonder when you were on the inset of starting your business, what was your take on innovation? What was your take on novelty? How much weight did you give it to at that time? What do you advise us like? When I was selling the business, what selling was the take on the, the innovation, etc.? That's a. I, if I can answer it, and I'm not, uh, I'm not doing a politician and ducking, um, but I need to say that when you are selling a business, the one thing you've got to remember is that uh, selling an ex-growth business um, is not the right way to get uh, maximum value. You've got to leave some in for the next man. Now, it's an interesting question you asked, but I didn't actually sell Sinseal on the basis that there were other innovations. There were still, we, we, we introduced uh, conservatories to the range, but unlike Doorstop, which is a very embryonic product, um, so we're weathering the economic storm nicely because the product is growing organically. Um, but the interesting thing with Sinsil, and I try, not to, I try not to tell porkies and deceive people because you get find, found out. Um, so you say it as it is and dress it as necessary. But the, the backdrop for selling Sinsil was, yes, it's a common growth business. Yes, there's a lot of mileage left in it. The market's still there. You're buying it at, a, at, the, so at the bottom of the market or for selling although I still got what I consider to be top money. Um, but I sold that on what I called a buy and build. Um, there's a lot of polarisation gone on in that industry. 20 years ago, there were 50 extruders. Now there's five, and two of those you can forget about. Um, so what um, uh, I sold it on was, OK, in order to achieve your desired ends and exit routes, either by flotation or whatever, um, then... Um, You've got to acquire other businesses, and that was, I suggested, and they agreed, you know, they didn't need to listen to me about it, they paid the good money, and they agreed and decided to do it on a vertical in integration as well as a, a conglomerate, a horizontal integration method. So there were no real innovations. Having said that, since I sold, they have introduced a whole bunch of new products, some of which I think are a complete waste of space, and others are absolutely brilliant. They've introduced some right cracking products. And, you know, I was never going to do that because m my guys and me, we had a, a pattern and we weren't looking wider. The new kid on the block, he does. Does that help? Yeah, and uh, it would also be interesting to know what was your take when you were starting the company? Oh, when I was starting it? Ah, oh. well, that is a story in itself, but I'll, I'll, I'll answer it as quickly as possible. Said at the outset, I'm looking for a product to build a direct sale company around. I got circularised by a firm called Hepworth's Industrial Plastics that work in the in Padium in the northwest. Um, they've got this product um, called PVC windows, um, and in that, uh, when I went along to see them in this sort of uh, get together presentation, it was a very crude presentation. Uh, I think the market penetration at that time was about less than one percent because it was all aluminium and wood. Um, I offered to manufacture, being an entrepreneurial type guy, I offered to manufacture their sales portfolios for them, uh, which was basically sticking photographs into books and what have you. Anyway, I delivered those uh, the first year, 78, um, and got me 1,500 quid. Uh, they rang me the second year, 79, wanted another load, so went up in my Trans Am Yank car and delivered them and got my money. 
By this time, market penetration was something like 2.5%, 3%. The third year, um, 1980, January, February, I went up and it had gone on exponentially. And I thought, aye, aye, this product is special. And I use myself as an acid test. Now, I used to think, I used to say, well, you know, would I have plastic, would I have aluminium, or would I have PVC? And if the answer is I'll have PVC, I'm probably as typical as the next guy. So that was a strong acid test that I've always used. Would I have a composite door? Yes, I've got composite doors, you know. Um, so, it very, again, very simple, um, but um, very effective. But when you're looking to build a direct sales business around anything, and it's not as it used to be, if you like, direct selling. But the, you're looking for an embryonic product because it has, of necessity, it must have uh, a mystique um, in order to command a premium price. Uh, because you need a premium price because, by God, you've got some sales and marketing expenses thrown in there. And uh, after, you know, nine or 12 months, um, the product's probably on the... If it's like electrical products, deep freezers that I used to sell, televisions I used to sell, it'd probably be on the shelves in the co-op and Comet at about half the price. The thing with the windows is it was a bespoke product, so it had a, it had a longer life, uh, it had more longevity as a, a direct sell product. Um, but that's, um, that really is uh, all I can do to answer that question. Thank you. You're very welcome. Anybody else? Oh, sir? I didn't say my greatest inspiration. I, 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 he is a hero of mine. Okay, okay, yeah, thank you. yeah. So, man, what are the most valuable things that you have learned from him which have impacted your business and personal life? Oh, some of the things that I've, uh, I've actually said here. You know, he, um, one of his uh, um, philosophers, tenets, canons, if you like, um, and I'm, I'm not sure whether I fully go along with it, but nevertheless, he's the boy. Um, he doesn't want to get involved in anything he doesn't understand. Now, I think he's probably saying, because he's far too good to mean that literally, I think probably what he's saying is he doesn't want to get involved in anything where he hasn't got his gang that understand it. You know, because I'm the least technical person on my firm, but I've always been good at finding a man that can, which is people again, you know? I go out and I find the person, and I do pay for him, you know? I never give him equity, but by God do I pay well. Um, and, and the, um, the idea of uh, Buffett saying, you know, I don't understand, I, I personally think that he means that in the looser sense where, yeah, he won't go into something where he hasn't got a man that understands or a team of men, you know what I mean? So, uh, is that uh, okay? Yeah. Thank you. So. Uh, to become a business leader in the industry is quite hard in today's... I'm sorry, I can't hear you. That's an interesting question as well. Um, the flip answer to that is that we didn't used to regard them as competitors. They were more a source of amusement. And uh, we were also m massively aggressive in the nicest possible commercial sense. Uh, the way we used to deal with competitors, quite frankly, was uh, uh, quite summary. Um, right, um, we were the biggest. Uh, and uh, I don't know. Bart's uh, extrusion decided to come and attack our customer base and he nicked a couple of our customers. Um, fine, that's okay, no problem. I used to give the order then. You go and get those two customers back at any price and you take four of his. <laughs> right. They don't come again. They don't come for any more. It's very simple. You've got to be ballsy. It's got to be your money, right? Which it was mine, so I can do it. Right? Tell that to your gaffer, you know, you... Tell that to your finance director and see what he says about that. He will not be happy. But it was very effective. And what's more, after a period of time, the competition, such as it is, knows what you're going to do. They know you're going to go after them. Right? So they go, it's like a burglar. Right? If your house is, you know, protected, they'll go next door. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to call it today at that, if you don't mind, folks. I thank you for listening. And I know that you won't all agree with what I've said, but I... Hope that if uh, nothing else, it'll have given you some food for thought. So thank you and good luck to you all.